Okay, colleagues, greetings. Hopefully, we are live. So, um, unfortunately, my schedule is super crazy these days. So, I'm trying to <laughs> devote as much time as I can to uh, this wonderful course, Philosophy of Science, but it doesn't always work out. So, um, this is going to be more or less a question and answer session. Let's, let's, let's you know, for a change. Uh, 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 a bit of you know meditative moment in the beginning. Just to get the mood going. Anyway, now, I mean, meditation is a very important um, practice in philosophy, and I feel it also has important relation and a role to play, even in philosophy of science. Uh, if, we had, if I had more time, I'd definitely make a <laughs> lecture about it. So uh, let me maybe immediately uh, 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 um, address this issue, that this course is very much a work in progress for me. So uh, I have spent all of summer, <laughs> recording the introduction to, uh, um, introduction to political philosophy for Coursera. Um, and that has gone up last week. And it's, you know, it's taking, it, it has taken a lot of work, especially in the, last, um, in the last 10 days or so to make sure that everything is finalized. So um, unfortunately, I feel that, you know, I always feel that I could be doing more. My lectures could be better. That's a... <laughs> Always a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of an issue and a bit of a challenge, um, but nevertheless, nevertheless, right? So this course, philosophy of science, I have been, I mean, in general, I've been teaching philosophy for around ten years now. Um, I've been teaching philosophy. I've been lecturing in this course, philosophy of science, for about five years, and I teach, I lecture in philosophy of science and also political philosophy. And over the years, the two courses have begun to converge in my head. I've started seeing certain very important parallels, and again, I. I began my first lecture talking about how we have this view from the inside and view from the outside. So philosophy um, of science and political philosophy. I feel it's a very important interface between the two. And uh, um, and basically, what is this interface? Well, there are many different aspects, but to me, the most important was one is this naturalistic worldview, and specifically this notion of uh, a mechanistic um, versus teleological picture of the world. Um, and I I'm constantly keep talking about how uh, we have this mechanistic picture in the natural sciences and you know, biology and physics, but also very importantly, you know, at some point we're going to need to start talking about um, mechanistic approaches, mm, uh, like let's, or let me say anti-teleology, uh, in the social sciences, starting with philosopher, with very important philosophers uh, such as Jean Battista Vico, um, and then very importantly philosophers such as Niccolo Machiavelli and uh, Hobbes, right? And and down the line, I mean, up until the birth of you know classical um, social science in people like uh, uh, Durkheim. Well, I mean, before that, and Marx, Marx, very, very importantly, anti-teleological thinker. Marx, Durkheim, and even I would say Weber. Weber, notoriously, is, is supposed to be on the side of the, uh, you know, this Verstehen, Verstehen und Erklären, right? Uh, uh, Weber is supposed to be side, on the side of the understanding sociology, but I want to say, if we read Weber very carefully, we see these iron cages in Weber. Stallhart des Gehauser. Again, all these... You know, structural forces that take advantage, take control of the human individual over and above their will. So um, this is kind of, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm trying to do. And in many ways, again, it's like, to me, this course is like a research seminar. I take topics which I find most interesting, most stimulating, and I try to share them with the students. And uh, we're having a dialogue, we're having wonderful presentations. This is a bit rough and a bit unpolished, it's true. But, you know, that's the price of uh, 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 thinking in progress, work in progress. Um, but, at the, you know, on the other hand, 
I feel that I'm giving to the students not some old and boring philosophy, you know, the way I understand it, but the cutting edge, the most interesting ideas, the most interesting problems that we have. So let me, mm, I kept talking about how we have, you know, a whole bunch of things that I, I'm, I'm constantly meaning to talk about, and there's never enough time. There won't be enough time here as well, but at least let me try to get some leeway. So first of all, um, let me talk about, well, again, I, I keep mentioning pragmatic approaches um, and pragmatic approaches to values in uh, Buddha, in Epicurus, and if you want, maybe in Hobbes, right? Or, or Buddha, Epicurus, Nietzsche, if you want. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I keep talking about how my three most important interlocutors th for this academic year are, well, not just for this academic year, but in the past 10 years are Buddha, uh, uh, Marx and Foucault. <laughs> uh, Marx was a bit of an Epicurean. Did you know that Marx actually wrote his dissertation on Epicurus? Uh, uh, and Foucault is a Nietzschean, so, you know, uh, um, Buddha Epicurus Nietzsche, Buddha Marx Foucault, it's, you know, more or less the same thing. Um, but let me, let, me, let, me, let me talk about something, because, you know, I, I want to get to the meat, not just talk in these general terms, but also uh, lay out some particular conceptual notions, right? So, um, on the one hand, we have Foucault, right? But on the, like people like Nietzsche and Foucault, let's say Nietzsche and Foucault. Uh, but on the other hand, we have philosophers such as Daniel Dennett. So, and I want to see the um, confluence, the similarities between the two approaches. And one immediate way is, again, I keep referring to this, uh, to this uh, a cryptic phrase, language speaks through me. It's not that I speak a language, it is that, that a language speak, is speaking through me. And um, I want to say, again, it's like this naturalistic anthropology. Um, and, you know, like to me, Nietzsche and Foucault more or less um, refer to the picture from the inside inside of our own heads. And again, this is this is why I refer to Heidegger. Again, the most important reason I refer to Heidegger is because Heidegger alerts our attention to the fact that if we pay very close attention to our experience, we see this dark tunnel. And from this dark tunnel, we have all sorts of, you know, dispositions, beliefs, values, desires. We find ourselves thrown into this world with, with dispositions, with values, with beliefs, with desires that we have not chosen. Right? Just seeing ourselves as part of larger, something larger. And then it We'll talk about, you know, view from the outside. Uh, he's much more interested in what the sciences are telling us, right? And so this phrase, language speaks through me, you know, it's applicable to Nietzsche, but it's also applicable to, you know, or Heidegger, but it's also applicable to Dennett, right? Dennett has a, Daniel Dennett, who's a wonderful philosopher, he's still alive, he's very old now. He had, there's an interview between Dennett and Sean Carroll uh, in his Mindscape podcast. And then Dennett has a wonderful book, it's called uh, um, Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. Um, and so, so it's religion as a natural phenomena, phenomenon, right? And so the idea of the book is that, well, <laughs> the idea is that ideas, it's like to use Richard, you know, a phrase that Dennett, I think, takes from Richard Dawkins, is that you can talk about me, uh, genes in uh, uh, evolution, or you can talk about memes in cultural evolution, cultural evolution, that the, your relationship to the ideas in your head is to some extent the, like the relationship of uh, you to your gut bacteria. And ideas, you know, like I, ideas or, or memes, like cultural code, they are to some extent maybe foreign and to some extent can be like bad or harmful to you. And again, you see like, it's another important topic I keep circling around, is that like skepticism and relativism uh, um, are, are good and bad at the same time. I, I feel that to do philosophy seriously, you need to be at least a little bit skeptical and at least a little bit a relativist. Like we have to start with this skeptical vertigo. Mm -hmm. Who knows what is true? Who knows what values are, right? But at the end of the day, you're, we're trying to reach some kind of positive conclusion. Like, like saying anything goes just doesn't, doesn't work out in, in reality, in, in real life. Life imposes its uh, limitations on us. Anyway, so 
an important idea. I, I feel like mentioning every time, right? So, so when I say that ideas are foreign and bad, some people are going to say, well, what is good? What is bad? And, you know, it's like, again, I try to stick with, again, with, <laughs> with Buddha, Epicurus, and Nietzsche. With Buddha, Epicurus, and Nietzsche, we know what is good or what is bad because we feel, again, it's like amor fati in Nietzsche, affirmation of life. You know what is health. You know what is happiness. It's an imminent criterion. We know it from within. Now, it doesn't mean that we cannot make, make mistakes. We can make mistakes, and it's, it's difficult, right? right? So, again, it's like I, f- I feel like maybe I should push this metaphor more and more. Uh, happiness is, is like health. It's hard to know exactly what it means to be healthy, and it's possible to make mistakes, and it's possible for people to give bad advice, right? People will tell you that something will make you healthier, but it makes you sick. People will tell you that something will make you happier, but actually it makes you unhappy, miserable, right? So, but again, I feel with, again, with Buddha, Epicurus, and Nietzsche, I'm on fairly strong grounds. Again, uh, you know, I have at least a preliminary way of talking about what, what, what is good and, and what is bad. Um, talk about skepticism, relativism. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Hegel, in his uh, phenomen- wonderful phenomenology of spirit, has this idea of stages. And I feel that Hegel is going to say that, again, a skeptical stage and a relativist stage is a very important stage on the way of development of philosophy. Like, if, if you stay there, you don't, you don't go anywhere. Like, if I were completely skeptical right now, why would, I even com- why would I even continue the sentence? Why would I even finish the sentence? Because if you, know, if you really want to be skeptical all the way, how do I know that what, you, know, you will understand my words? It's like, uh, how do I know what's going to be the effect of me finishing this sentence, right? Like, if you really, really, really want to be maximally skeptical, you just, you know, stop doing anything. And, in fact, you probably just stop breathing or something like that, right? Um, but, but as a stage, as a stage, skepticism, not taking things for granted is important. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talk about, I talk about everything at the same time. Let me go back to this idea of genes and memes. And, again, um, of, how, of how, again... Dennett is going to say that ideas, like memes, you can have memetic viruses, which are maybe foreign, maybe bad. And you see, Nietzsche and Foucault are going to talk about something very similar. Nietzsche and Marx and Foucault are going to talk about ideology. Ideology. Uh, or, or Foucault is going to talk about the discourse. And I feel that there's a deep analogy, there's a deep compatibility between what Nietzsche is saying and between what Foucault is saying and between what Dennett is saying. And these are completely different worlds. These philosophers come from different traditions, and yet they converge. And yet they converge. So um, let me continue on. Right. So uh, the most important um, idea in the first part of our course, in fact, it's also a very important idea in philosophy of history, and it's an important idea in uh, you know in, in political philosophy in people like Hegel and Marx. This is the idea of evolution and natural selection, um, so and especially selection pressure, um, and. Um, so let's 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 talk about this. There are two things I want to say. Well, again, we have this wonderful uh, 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 there's a wonderful book by Janet Richards, and um, she has a wonderful article about how Darwin is a you know is a continuation of the scientific revolution by other means. I honestly I should open and and Google give you the full name of the book, um, but. Um, mm, it's it's a it's a beautiful book. We're reading, yeah. It's called Human Nature After Darwin by Janet Richards. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to say exactly what year that is. I'm sorry, I'm wasting time a little bit. Is this important? Well, I I promised to cite my sources. It's 2001. Well, okay, fairly old book by, you know, by some standards. Uh, but a very nice book. And again, we're only reading one article from it, but still, I think, I think it's very important. So, and, and she refers to Daniel Dennett explicitly. Um, and um, she talks about how, um, well, I mean, mostly these are the ideas from Dennett. Um, how you can have sort of sc- Sky hooks and cranes, right? So you have this uh, 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 ancient teleological worldview, ancient teleological worldview. And again, I keep talking about how we have a certain evolutionary story as to why human beings have this evolved uh, agent detection mechanism. So we actually have something like a biological, evolutionary psychological account as to why human beings begin with teleological worldview. 
Um, and the idea is that mind somehow produces matter, or mind is more important than matter. It's a lot to be said about this. Various conceptions of God, at some point I need to talk about this. And uh, uh, Richards wants to contrast this uh, with the new kind of modern uh, mechanistic worldview. And on the modern mechanistic worldview, we want to say, no, that matter is primary and mind is a certain effect of matter. We're trying to explain away. And um, people want to say, well, okay, and you see, this is important, right? So it's like, I'm trying to find a new way of teaching philosophy because we know from Nietzsche and we know from Foucault that the way you present ideas, the way you present questions, the kinds of questions that you ask, the way you frame the conversation is important. Like, if we take Cartesian dualism seriously, that's a certain choice that a lecturer has to make, right? And I feel that I'm not saying that you shouldn't, right? So, like, you know, I'm a big believer in John Stuart Mill and the free, free and equal discussion, right? So, if people want to pursue, you know, Descartes and, you know, Cartesian dualism, etc., it's like, be my guest. In fact, I mean, uh, um, Sean Carroll has a wonderful conversation with Dave Chalmers and with uh, Philip Goff, right? And Dave Chalmers talks about uh, so, um, uh, property dualism and Philip Goff uh, uh, talks about panpsychism. So these two are interesting. So uh, let me let me even refer to this, right? Carol with uh, uh, Chalmers and Goff. Feel free to 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 check to check both of those out. So this is kind of ideas on the other ideas on the other side of the story. Arguments against my position. Again, if somebody wants to do a presentation, feel free. But still, to go back to uh, to this uh, uh, um, to this notion, right? So. I'm trying to find a new way of teaching philosophy because I feel that, again, to treat Descartes seriously and to really ask this question, like in 2021, you know, is mind, does mind come first or does matter come first? I'm, I don't want to say it's, in, I don't want to say it's irresponsible, but it's, it's, a, it's a choice that one makes and it's a choice that has consequences and potentially it could have bad consequences. And I, it is my executive decision that, again, I feel that kind of the weight of the history of philosophy is on my side that we should not treat Descartes as an equal you know, uh, uh, partner in conversation. There are so many philosophers, we have to make choices. It is my choice not to engage with Descartes. Uh, it, it, or, or, I, I mean, I am engaging quite a lot, as a matter of fact, it turns out, but I'm trying to engage less, right? But anyway, so we have this idea, mind mm, produces matter, and I want to say that especially within theological picture, within the theological pictures, uh, uh, or ideas of intelligent design, we have this problem of evil, right? And we, it, it's something that students get very passionate about. I, I get asked about the problem of evil every class. Uh, uh, and again, like what I'm trying to say is that um, I don't think that the problem of evil has, has a solution. Um, the problem of evil, I feel, throughout the history of the world, is the leading cause why people become atheists. The leading, the leading reason. So wonderful biblical scholar, Bart D. Ehrman, uh, he's, he sits in the presidium of the American uh, Biblical Association. He's a, he's an, a, a prime scholar of uh, uh, early Christian writings. So he's you know it's like he's a <laughs> one of the world's leading experts in that. And he grew up as a Christian and he became an atheist as a result of thinking that the problem of evil cannot be solved. Right. So if I mean obviously people get PhDs in theology, there are ways to solve this problem. The question is, are those ways really plausible, right? <laughs> and what I'm driving at, and another thing I want to say, so first of all, it's like so the, prob the problem of evil might have a solution, but to me, the problem of evil might have a solution, but also my tongue might turn into a centipede in the, same, in, in the next moment, right? And I treat those two as equally likely, more or less, right? Even though I don't have a knockdown argument against my argument, against my tongue turning into a centipede, I don't have a knockdown argument against the, you know, the solutions, potential solutions to the, to the problem of evil. Mm. But also, and this is an important thought uh, I'm trying to get out, is that um, I feel that, again, the, this teleological picture, on, te teleological and theological picture, you can have, this is very important, I, I, I have, I'm talking about everything at the same time, but still, you can have teleology without theology, um, and you can have theology without teleology. So you can have versions of God, like in the most uh, simple case, gods who are amoral, or gods who do not care about us. So, um, so a moral or indifferent gods, right? So, and, and this, this would, this would be a picture of, uh, uh, 
Again, belief in God without belief in, in, in teleology. On the other hand, philosophers such as Tom Nagel imagines that you can have teleological understanding of the universe without postulating an existence of supreme being like God. Um, I should ref I should make a reference. Hiskel Kaufman, and this is a, not the first time I'm referring to this, very important uh, Jewish theologian of the 20th century, he talks about this kind of meta-divine realm, magic, polytheism, how polytheism actually has a bit of this uh, 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 mechanistic picture built into it. Meta-divine realm. Um, again, this, I understand this is chaotic and maybe not very clear, so in many ways, kind of this kind of discussion, this live stream, whatever, is an invitation for you colleagues to pick up on something that you find interesting and ask me, or and, and maybe make a presentation on this. Thankfully, we have the subject, World in Sexual History, beginning tomorrow, so maybe somebody will actually make a presentation on Kaufman. We'll see how it goes. Um, um, so anyway, so... But let me, again, I understand this is a bit chaotic. I, I, I told you, I told you, it's a work in progress. You see my thoughts unfolding in front of your eyes. If I had more time, I'd, I'd do this first, and then, then I'd go through this notes and do a lecture. But I feel that with my schedule, you know, I'm going to do a proper lecture on this next year. <laughs> so so, so, so you, you, are getting, you are getting a sneak peek, sneak peek. So, and you have to imagine also, before I recorded a lecture on Coursera, Introduction to Political Philosophy, I've also had like a million sessions like this. They were not recorded and uploaded to YouTube, but yeah, but you know, I have inflicted my chaotic mind on the students. I mean, the lectures on Coursera are also somewhat chaotic to some extent, but they are far less chaotic than, for example, what you're seeing right now. Anyway, so, um, so the, the point I was trying to make is that, so on the theological picture, on the theological, theological picture, the evil is a problem. If this universe is made by, is intelligently designed, why is there evil? On the mechanistic picture, order is a problem. Why is there order? So, um, why order, right? And in fact, Dennett makes this point very forcefully, and I think it's a, it's a deeply important idea, right? So, what you have is, uh, in the theological or teleological mode of explanation, this is not really an explanation. This is not an explanation. It's an appeal to a miracle. Because you explain the simpler by appeal to the complex. The simpler is explained through the complex. So uh, um, if you want, again, this is, Dennett gives this quote, somebody criticizing Darwin, how um, in the old theological worldview, absolute, absolute wisdom, absolute intelligence, is the ultimate explanation for ignorance, right? So ignorance exists because God, absolute intelligence, willed it into existence. So this pencil, for example, as far as we can tell, is completely dumb. It's, it's mindless. Mindlessness exists because of infinite with wisdom, the infinite wisdom of God. So uh, uh, absolute wisdom produces, uh, well, everything, including, you know, mindless matter. Right, And I want to say, in an important respect, uh, this is not a very good explanation because you are substituting a lesser mystery for a greater mystery. Because if, if, if nothing else, I mean, God is incomprehensible. The major world religions, you know, Hindu monotheism, monotheism Advaita Vedanta, or, you know, pseudo Dionysius Areopagite, or, you know, you know Plotinus, Neoplatonists, or, are all going to say God is incomprehensible, God is a miracle. This is not an explanation. It's an appeal to miracles. This, this whole story is not an explanation. It is an appeal to miracles, right? Whereas here, yes, you have a problem, the problem of explaining order. And this is incidentally what Aristotle, for example, thought, right? That this world is far too orderly to be explicable through simple, random chance, right? Um, but, you know, this is, this is why... Darwin is so important. This is why Turing is so important. Because they provide a plausible mechanism. Not a knockdown complete story, but a plausible proof of concept that you can explain order. So here you have problem of evil in the teleological picture. But here you have, if you want, problem of order. So problem of order. And yes, you want to say that you explain the complex by the appeal to the simple, right? You go, you explain the complex in terms of the simple. And in fact, it is w wisdom that is created by absolute ignorance. So absolute uh, uh, ignorance gives rise 
to wisdom. Wisdom, mindfulness, that kind of thing, right? So these, the fluctuations in the quantum fields, which are mindless and meaningless, presumably, give rise to wisdom, right? So, so in an important respect, I want to say evolutionary explanation is not an explanation. It is the explanation. It is the only thing, the only conceptual notion worthy of the name of an explanation. Now, of course, it relies on assumptions. It's not knocked down. And you could say, and philosophers sometimes like to talk about this, how science also relies on kinds of credence that maybe you want to call faith or not. Uh, uh, so, some, so does it, does it, you, you rely on assumptions? Yes, you rely on assumptions. Does it mean that you need to have faith? Well, I want to say not exactly because this is supposed to be a hypothetical fallibilist picture. You're not supposed to have faith in this uh, uh, um, hypothetical fallibilist picture. But, you know, um, this, this is a long discussion. I don't want to oversimplify it. And in fact, Hans-Georg Gadamer and Martin Heidegger have this very important rehabilitation of prejudice, right? That science, I mean, in general, human life relies on prejudice, assumptions if you want, and, and science also relies on assumptions and prejudice. So I don't want to uh, necessarily uh, 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 kind of reduce the complexity, potential complexity of this entire conversation. Mm. But another thing, sort of continuing on from this notion of uh, evolution and natural selection, I want to um, sort of, again, not just give these broad brushstrokes overviews, but also give you, give you some, you know, some concepts, some ideas, some concrete ideas to think about. So, and the concrete ideas is how does, like, ev again, the way evolution works, evolution works through complete randomness. Uh, um, now, I don't like the word randomness because I feel that for methodological reasons, I prefer deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics. So it is complete, blind, chaotic, uh, 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 like stochastic uh, process. So not necessarily random, but stochastic. I need to find the etymology of the word stochastic. By the way, I am completely obsessed with etymologies. You know what? Just for fun, if you're tuning in, again, this is already so chaotic, uh, just a fun fact. Did you know that the word deos and the word theos come from different roots? You know, this is something I, I like to think I share with Nietzsche passion for etymologies, especially passion for Indo-European etymologies. Did you, did you know, colleagues, that the word theos, theos and the word deus come from completely different roots? Theos um, comes from the Sanskrit root, which I, I cannot tell you what the Sanskrit root is, but feel free to look this up, Sanskrit root, uh, which is cognate to... Um, the English word do, the, you know, theos is, means, I mean, of course, some of you at this point will realize that they do not know what theos means. Theos in, is God in Greek. Theos means God in Greek. And the word God or gods, right? Uh, the, thea is a goddess in Greek. And um, the word theos comes from the word do, so it means that gods are doers. They, 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 are, they, are, they, are, they are beings with power, right? And deus is actually cognate, it's a, it's a Latin word, which also comes from Sanskrit. Uh, ultimately, it is cognate to the word Zeus, the name of God Zeus, and it comes not from the word do, but from the word day. So, uh, a day mean, in, in, meaning sky. So, uh, Theos is gods, gods as makers, like if you want powerful makers, like gods are makers. And the and, and Deus means gods who live in the sky, are sky beings, sky dwellers. I don't know. Do you find this interesting? I find this endlessly fascinating. Sorry. You could say it's a complete digression. I sometimes do this. <laughs> but I hope it's fun at least. Um, let, me, let me go back. Let me go back to, uh, uh, mm, to the story I was telling. Yeah. So, so when we talk about evolution, I, and I kept talking about how evolution is uh, um, is the only thing that's worthy of an explanation. Now, it's, so it's not bulletproof. It's not bulletproof, not bulletproof, but it's the best we've got. In fact, I want to say it's not just the best. It's really the only explanation that we have. And so um, the idea is the following, right? So, I mean, I don't want to, it's like, 
life is chemical. Life is chemistry. If you don't believe that, you should take a chemistry or a biology class. Okay, I just, I'm just going to assume that. We have this picture fairly settled down, right? So, like, since the discovery, like, and notice, notice, people, this is so important. A hundred years ago, this was a battle. This was a battle a hundred years ago. Uh, um, it's like between vitalists and mechanicists. Vitalists versus mechanicists, right? Uh, and, and this battle was won by mechanicists. Nobody really today s seriously believes, no serious biologist or doctor believes that life is something else apart from chemistry. We know that, let's say, let's say the virus of COVID is, is basically just a molecule. It's basically just a long RNA molecule, maybe wrapped in some chromatin or something, I forget, right? Um, so, you know, it's, 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 just, it's just a chemical molecule. There's nothing magical about it. There's no elan vital, right? And I want to say, a hundred years will pass and we will treat consciousness the same way. This is how the hard problem of consciousness will be solved. It's not going to be some kind of magic bullet solution. No, no, no. It's just there's going to be so much evidence, so much understanding of how consciousness works that nobody's really going to be asking this question. In the same fashion how nobody's a vitalist today. So I, fe I feel that there's a lesson to be learned about the hard problem of consciousness. Um, and... and so, so I, I, I'm betting on the mechanistic picture advancing even further, right? Um, but anyway, so again, so we assume that life is chemistry. So you imagine some proto-cell, proto-cell with a, with a proto-DNA molecule, proto-DNA molecule, which contains genetic code. And it's, it's important, and there's all sorts of catchphrases I highly recommend. So if you go to uh, Open Yale Web Course, Open Yale Website, which is my favorite website in the entire web, op oyc.yale.edu, you can find people such as Stephen Stearns and Robert Wyman, who will uh, fill you in on the details of this picture, or you can look uh, uh, at Stanford, uh, um, wonderful course by Robert Sapolsky, so many people know Sapolsky and love Sapolsky, and I also love Sapolsky, it's brilliant, so, but, you know, it's like, they will fill in some of the gaps of the story that, that I'm telling, um, and by the way, feel free to do your presentations on this. So also this Paul Bloom and Robert Wright. Should I mention these? Paul Bloom from Yale and Robert Wright from Princeton. Uh, and I have to say, I, th I hope this is how you spell right. Maybe this is how you spell right. Probably this is how you spell right. Uh, I, I disagree with a lot of things they say. I disagree with Robert Wright's uh, uh, understanding of Buddhism. I completely disagree with his understanding of Buddhism. Uh, no, I don't want to say completely, but to a very large extent. Uh, 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 but, you know, he, he has a wonderful course on Coursera, being a psychologist at, at Princeton. And I think there's a lot to learn from this course. Take it with a grain of salt. I, you know, I would recommend, but still. Anyway, so you, you start with this proto-cell, proto-DNA. And what happens is that the universe is a chaotic place. Again, the question is, how do you get order from, from chaos? How do you get order from chaos? So let me, let me add this to the title. Order from chaos. And, and the answer is basically, the universe is a chaotic place. The universe is a chaotic place. So for some completely, I don't want to say random because I don't believe in randomness, right? But for some completely unrelated, unintentional reason. So completely unintentionally, something messes with your DNA molecule. Proto DNA molecule, genetic code, and so what you get is that chaos gives you variation for free. Uh, produces variation for free, and this is basically the only thing that you need to get evolution going. Again, like the the the, the point of this entire picture, the point of this entire picture is that, um, like, it's like I mean. How do you get order from chaos? The universe is a chaotic place. Chaos produces variation for free in this first proto-DNA molecule. And then, like, what you get is variation. And once you get variation, you, you, uh, natural selection can begin to operate. And so, vari you know, this random variation, random mutations. Um, and again, it, it is a very unfortunate fact of life, right? Um, Produce variations and very and natural selection can operate on these uh, mutations, right? Like, if we live long enough, my uh, biologist friend tells me, biologist friend, 
biologist friends tell me, all of us will get cancer. Simply because there's, let's say, cosmic rays shooting down from the sky. Not because God wants them to, but because the universe is a chaotic, messy place. You know, a billion light years from, from us, uh, a supernova explodes and there's an energetic photon that, you know, knocks out a chunk of my DNA and my cell becomes cancerous. It's an unfortunate fact of life, right? Again, the, the, the teleological picture is deeply comforting. If you have a pimple on your forehead or a splinter on your toe, this makes sense. This has meaning. On the mechanistic picture, no. You have this blind, deterministic chaos. You have this blind chaos, right? Something just comes in and, and knocks out a chunk of your DNA. But the thing is that once you get variation, naturally, you know, as long as life is able to persist, because, of course, in the next moment, we could have a supernova explosion and all of, our, all of life on Earth is going to be, uh, you know, er eradicated. Or you can have, like, something like a false vacuum of the Higgs field and all life in the universe is going to be eradicated. That's, that's a possibility. That's, a, that's always a possibility on the mechanistic picture. This universe is not moving in any interesting place, as, as far as we can tell. Mm. But still, right? Um, the point is that this randomness will give you anything and everything, Right? So it's like a monkey typing on a typewriter. If the monkey types for long enough, it will, you know, type everything. But this is this is the this is the first cause of the of, of how evolution proceeds. And so let's imagine, right? So let me give you uh, three examples. Let me t uh, be very brief about it. Uh, plant, uh, COVID virus, and rain dance, right? And so equally, you, have, you can have an evolutionary explanation. Why do plants turn leaves toward the sun? Plants turn leaves, right? So there, there's an explanation, right? So there's, there's a certain mechanism. There's a certain uh, uh, mechanism in plant, like you have photoreceptor cells, right? And they secrete variable rates of certain hormones and, and they make the, the leaf turn towards the sun, right? So there's a mechanistic explanation. If you want uh, to use technical jargon, like a synchronic explanation, Right? So like right now, structurally, this is why the plant turns its leaf toward the sun. There's a mechanism. But this mechanism ultimately is traceable to, so mechanism now is traceable to an, a random event in, in the past, random mutation in the past. And this random mutation got fixed because it helped the plant to you know, persist into the future. Right, and you you can talk about survival or reproduction, but these are more or less the same thing. Survival or reproduction, more or less the same thing, because what we're talking about is again this process ontology, processes continuing into the future, like processes that persist into the future. So, like the uh, 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 certain forces that force certain patterns to repeat themselves like repeating patterns and um, so Nico Tin Tinbergen wonderful Nobel Prize winning uh, biologist this is this is obviously a quote popularized by Robert Sapolsky Tinbergen is gonna say a chicken is just an eggs way of making another egg a chicken is just an eggs way of making another egg egg. And notice, notice, right, another phrase that Sapolsky likes is that evolution is not a designer, evolution is a tinkerer. Evolution is not a designer, it is a tinkerer, a blind tinkerer, blind watchmaker, right? Um, somebody like Dawkins would say, right? And yeah, and, and again, it's like, mm, a chicken is just an egg's way of making another egg. A, a phenotype, phenotype, is just a genotypes way of making of 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 you know of gene of uh, genetic lineages persisting into the future genotypes way of you know persisting into the future and you know sometimes you have to in order for the genes to persist into the future you have to look out for number 1 right so if you persist into the future your genes persist into the future right but also, sometimes you need to have offspring, and, and so this is how you pass on genes. But in an important sense, the genes, the genetic code is real, but, but you are not real in an important respect, right? But let me, let, let's imagine, right? So we talk about plants turning leaves toward the sun, COVID or rain dance, right? So plants turn their leaves toward the sun. 
not because there's an intention, but simply because this helps them survive and reproduce. This helps, you know, genes survive into the future. Genes sort of helps genes survive into the future. Survive or persist into the future. Um, but the idea is that, again, COVID makes you cough, not because it wants to make you cough, but because viruses that make you cough, it's like what, when you cough in your saliva, you know, the virus is spreading around, right? And in a similar fashion, there's an idea of, a, you, you, can, you can go from genetic code to cultural code. So genetic to cultural code. And you see, immediately, when we talk about cultural code, we have to be very careful because genetic code, you can um, isolate in a test tube. You can't really isolate cultural code into the test tube. But the idea is similar. That, again, it's like genes can take control of you. And it's like not all genes are necessarily good for you. What is the difference? What is the difference between, between a gene and a virus? What is the difference between a gene and a virus? And in an important respect, there is no difference. Both code for behavior. So, like, I have genes that allow me to, I don't know, metabolize sugar. I, you know, it's like a virus gets into my cells and, you know, it, it, it makes me sneeze. It's like it, it, there's ways of coding for behavior, right? And then cultural code also codes for behavior. It's like, again, <laughs> then, it, then it gives this example of monastic orders, right? How there's, there's something akin. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, overstretch this analogy, but... There's something parasitic, there's at least an element of parasitism in, in the uh, cultural code of a monastic order, right? It takes advantage of the body of the monk. It makes, you know, the monk is going to go celibate. The monk is maybe going to go hungry, going to mortify the flesh at the cost of the monastic order thriving and spreading around. So you see, like, huh? genes can take advantage of you. This is not a very careful phrase, but it's something to think about. Genes can take advantage of you and memes can take advantage of you, huh? Like, genes inhabit us, our bodies, and memes also inhabit us, inhabit our minds. Again, and this can be linked to concepts of ideology in, in, in Nietzsche, uh, Marx, Weber, Freud, uh, or Foucault, right? Um, so, I, so again, so the idea of the rain dance, it's like, again, you have indigenous tribes, anthropologists tell me, but again, I'm not an expert on this. It's like, they do this dance to summon the rain. And so you would imagine, you would think, that, the, you know, this probably, you know, you, you think this would help them, uh, uh, you know, bring about rain, but no, actually it doesn't. What happens is that uh, uh, cultures that evolve rain dances, actually they have higher group cohesion, group cohesion, and this is why the, they, they survive into the future. And the idea is the same. There was a random mutation in the past. Somebody, for a completely random reason, mistakenly thought that dancing around helps to bring rain about, right? And, and this mute, cultural mutation has been retained in the MIMO type because it increases group cohesion. Because when a tribe performs a rain dance, you know, they bond, right? But the point is, and this is, this is, this is what I'm driving at, like language speaks through me. Language speaks through me. The plant doesn't know why it turns its leaves toward the sun, uh, uh, why it turns the leaf. The COVID doesn't know why it makes you cough. And by the same token, uh, like an in indigenous tribesman, a hunter-gatherer, doesn't know... Let, let me write the word tribesman doesn't know why they why why they engage in the rain dance doesn't know why they you know why they do the rain dance they do not know the real reason they can tell you a story they can tell you a story but the story as far as we can tell is false so in an important sense the anthropologist knows better so, but let me continue this. Let me continue because you see, some of you may see where this is going. I do not know why I am giving why I am giving this lecture. In fact, in an important respect, I don't exist. My behavior is a very complicated product of, you know, genes and memes, uh, 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 um, 
that have resulted from natural selection. Resulted from natural and cultural selection. I can tell you some story about how, you know, I'm a university professor, I enjoy doing this, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, I do not know the reason. And it's like, if you ask me, why do I enjoy doing this? I don't know why I enjoy it, right? I, I, it's like making the organism enjoy or not enjoy something is a, a way in which genes control our behavior. It's like making you like sweet things is a way in which your genes code for like more efficient ways of you... Uh, you know, getting calories from sugar because sweet foods tend to be, you know, high in sugar. But you don't know. And the genes don't know. It's a, it, ultimately, it's a result of blind mechanistic process, ultimately traceable to a uh, stochastic, you know, blind, chaotic, you know, mutation. Completely, complete, you know, completely random mutation. Random from the standpoint of, you know, teleology. Like, completely non-teleological mutation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I want to say that in many ways, this strikes me as maybe the most important idea in all of sciences and all of philosophy. Like this is this is this is this is what this is why I this is why I, I think I find thinking exciting. Okay, so I'm sure there's a million other things I wanted to talk about. Uh, I promised to talk about Leibniz, and. Uh, um, I promise to talk about ideas of God. It's like, you know, I'm not going to do this now because I'm getting a bit tired. But this is this is home, home you know, for people, for students who are going to take my classes. And it doesn't matter which class you take because this is relevant for all classes. Every class I take, this is relevant. Um, think about the various conceptions of God. God or gods. Very, very different gods. You know, it's like, and, um, you know, but I, I won't do this rigorously. But think of Cthulhu who wants you to, I don't know, uh, sacrifice uh, virgins. Sacrifice virgins. I'm not sure if Cthulhu actually wants you to do that, but some of that. Uh, or corn or Nurgle. Imagine that there's more than one god. Imagine that there's more than one god, right? Or, you know, think think, think of, the of the Neoplatonic one. The Neoplatonic one. It's like the Neoplatonic one doesn't know that probably doesn't even know that you exist. The Neoplatonic one is probably not even conscious, right? It's an idea of ideas from which existence emanates as a, as a, 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 a em, emanation as a, as an unintentional byproduct. I have a favorite theologian. My favorite theologian is Ibn Rushd, and. Um, He's my favorite theologian, but I'm not an expert, okay? So both can be true at the same time. As far as I remember, according to Ibn Rushd, also known as Averroes, uh, Allah, because Ibn Rushd was, you know, wrote, uh, wrote in Muslim Spain. Um, so, according to, you know, according to Averroes, as far as I remember, feel free to check this out. Allah doesn't know how many books I have on my shelf behind me. Why? Because it is below the dignity of Allah to occupy his mind. Although, why do we call Allah a he? It's not exactly clear. Because uh, 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 the origin of all existence should be beyond gender, presumably. right? But anyway, so God doesn't know how many chairs there are in this room or how many books there are on this table. God doesn't know that I exist and doesn't care that I exist because it's, it's, it's below the dignity of God to care about such petty things. Notice, uh, this, is, this is another you know, possible solution to the problem of evil, right? Evil exists because God just, don't, just doesn't care, you know, just, just happens. And again, within, within, the, within this uh, picture of emanation in the, in the Neoplatonic one, you know, there, there, is a, there is a very important element of dualism. There's uh, um, one tohen in Greek, which is the fullness of being, um, fullness of being and goodness. But then there's there's negativity, there's matter, nothingness, which is at the edge of matter, and in an important sense, like there, there's a, there's an edge to the influence of the one. There are places in the universe where the light of the one does not shine brightly enough, and this is why children are born with cancer, not because the one is evil. But because, in, in an important respect, the one is not absolute. It's like a light bulb, and at some point, you know, you have penumbra, you have shadow. 
And so this this is kind of kind of a mechanistic ways of thinking about God or gods, right? Or or you can have you know I talk about uh, Cthulhu sacrificing virgins. There's a very famous story about how Jephthah sacrifices his virgin daughter to Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, uh, Jephthah is explicitly referred to in the book of Hebrews, uh, um, sorry, in the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, Jephthah is specifically referred to as one of the saintliest, most saintliest people of all times and places. Check out the story. So it's not only Cthulhu who wants you to sacrifice virgins. Um, again, colleagues, please. I'm oversimplifying, and I'm being a bit facetious, okay? Uh, you know, I, this, it's, these are complicated topics, and I'm kind of, I'm being slightly, you know, too controversial, slightly too edgy, but I want to perk up your interest, right? Um, okay, so, so but, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fun story, but whatever. Uh, God of Saints Row, so, a wonderful game I played maybe 10 years ago. Um... It's like in this, it's a video game. Uh, if you r cause carnage and run over innocent pedestrians, the more carnage you cause, the, the more you, I don't know, level up such that the god of Saints Row will give you immortality and much more importantly, infinite ammo. Uh, I'm not sure if it's complete immortality, but it's going to be, Im Im yeah, well, it's going to be Im 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 immunity to damage. You can still die by falling from a high building infinite ammo. Why? Because you cause, just by causing carnage. And it's like, you know, to me, like, do you believe in God is a very strange question, because which God? Mm -hmm. Another important uh, question. We have discussed this with some of the groups. Uh, people talk about the God. Is Zeus the God? You know, within our, it's, very, it's a very important pedagogical advice. We need to see complexity in place of simplicity. Don't just assume that Zeus is the god. First of all, he's not the first god. He's not the creator of all. He has, he has parents. So Zeus has parents. But also, very importantly, in the Iliad, look this up. This is Zeus and Serpedon. Zeus has a son, Serpedon. And Serpedon has fate. Fate. The fates. Moira. As this, is, this is important. This is uh, Goethe. My favorite poem by Goethe. Prometheus. Prometho, Prometheus, right? And uh, uh, uh. Prometheus says to Zeus, Und das ewige Schicksal, meine Herren und deine. Das ewige Schicksal, meine Herren und deine. The immortal fate, my master and yours. Zeus is not, about, is not above fate. He has a favorite son, Sarpedon, who fights on the side of the Trojans. Patroclus mortally wounds Sarpedon, and Zeus cannot help him, cannot or will not help him because the fates have decreed that Sarpedon will die. There are different versions of God. It's like, and, and not, and, and theology is, does not equal teleology. Oops, sorry. Okay, anyway, I could go on, but, and I have a million other thoughts in my head. Uh... I suppose the last thing I want to say is, you know, um, skepticism, right? Whenever we talk about this, it's, it's very important to maintain a certain kind of skeptical attitude. So it's like, when, when I talk about this beautiful picture from protons to presidents, uh, can we be sure that, you know, it is bulletproof? No, it's not bulletproof. It, it could turn out to be wrong. And in fact, there's a very important uh, discussion we've been having last year with Andre. Andrei probably knows what discussion I'm talking about, about how, so this is, this is related to Thomas Kuhn, the idea of incommensurability. and uh, 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 paradigms. Like, which questions do we uh, count as serious? What questions count as serious, right? What, what, what kind of evidence is admissible? What lines of argument are considered valid? valid? And so we've been talking about how uh, 
sorry, I meant lines. Yes. We've been talking about how, like, Aquinas, on proofs of God's existence, Aquinas on, uh, you know, Aquinas' proofs, Aquinas' is five ways, right? Uh, it's like, I feel that most people, they would strike today, or at least most students I teach, they strike as deeply implausible, right? And there's a, and there's a very important lesson for us to see here, right? That people in the Middle Ages found those arguments completely watertight, as watertight as my story, you know, about protons and presidents. So when I say, and Andrei, we had this wonderful discussion last year, and this year Andrei pointed out that when I say that evolution is the only thing that counts as an explanation, whereas this theological stuff is appeal to miracles and is not really an explanation, uh, 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 so miracles are not explanation. Andre pointed out that, you know, but the ancients thought that these explanations were good. A and maybe, you know, generations down the line will think that this kind of explanation doesn't work very well. And uh, Thomas Kuhn, when he talks about paradigm shifts and irrationality of theory choice, kind of alerts our attention to the same fact. And I want us to be aware of this. So it's like, I'm trying to sort of, uh, like, I'm trying to hang out in the middle. We, I want to be, I want to pursue the naturalist picture. But I also don't want us to have blind faith in naturalist picture. I feel that the naturalist picture is a good working hypothesis, but we should be open to the possibility that it's false. But at the same time, we cannot be too open to the possibility that it's false, because if we become too open to the possibility, we become paralyzed. And so for pragmatic reasons, we have to rely on it. And again, again, I keep talking about how pl placing bets. Like you, every time you do something, decide to do something with your life, you're making a decision which, which is going to have consequences down the line. Okay, so, uh, uh, um, I don't know. Let me maybe also, as a postscriptum, mention Sabine Hossenfelder in a recent uh, uh, um, collaboration with Midlife Crisis. And I'm, I'm increasing, I increasingly like uh, Sabine more and more. Um, and she, she, you know, they, they were discussing how the universe is going to end. And Sabine said that, you know, like, if you look at this picture and you try to extrapolate and you talk about heat death of the universe, she says you shouldn't take it too seriously. Don't take heat death too seriously. And I, th I, I feel it as a very important philosophical lesson in what Sabine has said. Because the longer you extrapolate into the future, the more there's a chance that there are some small corrections to this formula down the line, which, which are invisible to us, that will become more and more important. So basically, as time goes to infinity, let me write this, as time goes to infinity, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do it this way, yeah, your error bars go to infinity as well. And so your confidence has to go down to zero. So it's like, if I were to tell you that the universe is going to die a heat death and into the infinity years into the future, there's going to be heat death and nothingness based on this picture. Your confidence in that has to be zero, rationally speaking, because the error bar is from plus infinity to minus infinity. Think about that. And this, this, is, why, this is why I really love Sabine. One of these days, maybe me and Nikolai are going to do a collab. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I have proposed to Nikolai we do a collaboration on Sabine's super determinism, which is, a, which is another deterministic interpretation of quantum mechanics. Oh, Nikolai is actually saying hi in the chat. I don't know. I, I don't want to impose. And my schedule is super crazy. It's probably not going to happen anytime soon. I need to brush up on it. But, you know, if one of these days, if we could do a collaboration, I, I'd enjoy it. I'd enjoy it. Anyway, uh, this, this has been a Q&A, so it's been super chaotic, even more chaotic than everything else I do. But it's okay, you are watching me, you know, think live. Um, it's a work in progress. I hope it's going to, you know, I hope it's going to become less chaotic as time goes on. Anyway, um, I feel that I probably, you know, we should probably stop here. So colleagues... If you, if you stuck around for so long, I've been going on for an hour. If you stuck around for so long, I hope that you found something of value. So in general, until next time, 
Thank you for all your contributions. Stay safe and take care.